KGW News at noon. And we begin with an update on the 911 outages in Washington. The system went down for about 12 hours. This noon, most service has been restored, but officials warn callers could still have issues getting through. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Brenda Braxton. Let's get right out to KGW's Kyla Boshi. He's joining us live in Vancouver. Kyle, Clark County 911 came back online around 8 a.m. Brenda, it has indeed. It's been restored early this morning, but that comes after a long night. Like a lot of other people, I jumped out of bed last night when my cell phone went off with what appeared to be an emergency message. The cryptic text message said, this is Crescent 911. 911 lines are down in our area. Call this phone number for emergencies. Well, the problem is a lot of people didn't know what Cressa is. The Clark County Regional Emergency Services Agency provides 911 dispatch for Vancouver and the surrounding area. The 911 center in Clark County, like many others across the state of Washington, went down Thursday night because of CenturyLink phone outages. So to inform the public that 911 wasn't working in Vancouver, Cressa sent out the alert to everyone who'd signed up for emergency notification within a 40-mile radius. That means thousands of people in the Portland metro area got the alert around 11.30 last night. Emergency dispatchers say they were swamped with calls from confused customers who didn't understand why they were getting the message or what it meant. And I spoke with administrators from Cressa just a short time ago. They admit that improvements can be made. First of all, the wording could be much more clear in the message they sent out. Additionally, they want to look at the software. So next time they send it out, it doesn't go to such a broad area. Back to you. Well, today, a Portland man gave his first live interview about his brand new world record. He crossed the entire continent of Antarctica on his own. He made it across the finish line just yesterday, and Christine Pitowanich has been following his journey. So, Christine, he spoke exclusively with the Today Show about his amazing accomplishment. Brenda, when you hear his story, really all you can say is, wow, he planned to cross Antarctica in 70 days, but he did it in 54. And, you know, while he was super tired, he did take a moment to talk a little about how he kept himself going in one of the harshest environments on the planet. I will be attempting a world first. A solo, unsupported, unaided crossing of Antarctica. That was Colin O'Brady before his world record-breaking trip across the continent of Antarctica. To show you that nothing is impossible. Fast forward to today, and he has done it. O'Brady spoke exclusively with the Today Show about his accomplishment. I'm not going to lie, I'm, I'm a little tired. And it's no wonder. His journey spanned 932 miles. After 54 long days, he crossed the finish line on Thursday. The first thing he did called his wife. It was an emotional conversation. It was a lot of pride, and we were just all screaming and hooting and hollering and, and happy that he was there safely. It is an incredible feeling. I'm just so excited and uh, grateful for um, to be here safely. The trip wasn't easy. O'Brady hauled a roughly 400-pound sled day after day in one of the most extreme environments on Earth. Minus 30 degrees out, winds blowing 60 mile per hour. I don't know, the wind chill like minus 100, something crazy. And I kept pulling my sled 12, 13 hours every single day. I never took a rest day. And he never stopped believing in himself. Every morning I'd wake up and I'd tell myself, Mantra, you're strong, you're capable, you can do this. Now, on the other side of the finish line, he's 40 pounds lighter. So first order of business will be a proper meal. But he's most looking forward to what comes after that. And then when I get back to South America, wrapping my arms around Jenna, my amazing wife, will be my very first thing. I can't wait to see her. And um, this is, like I said, been both of our dream come true. So another reason that his trip was so inspiring, about 10 years ago, he was badly burned in an accident and was told he might never walk again. O'Brady says he hopes his project inspires others to take on their dreams, however impossible they may seem. Back to you. I think he's done that and then some. Dean. Well, now it's on to our long holiday weekend, and come on, nobody could blame you if that's all you can think about on this Friday afternoon. Check out those sky cams. Those four pretty much cover the state, showing conditions from the coast to the Cascades. 
Meteorologist Rod Hill is also talking New Year's. I know you've been going over that holiday forecast. How are things looking right now? Well, for travel, the news is terrific. I'm going to show you a bunch of past cameras that basically show the easiest travel conditions, the best road conditions, if you will, that we've had all week. So we're still in this very cloudy pattern for the remainder of today, including this evening and overnight tonight. But this rain will continue to be nothing more than it's been here on the west side, meaning the coast and the valley. And that's anything from some very light rain to some sprinkles and kind of back and forth. There's the Rose City camera. We're at 45 degrees. Temperatures holding steady. Maybe we bounce up another degree or two, and that's about it. So I've got us at 47 at 3 o'clock. Still the same thing. Sprinkles slash light rain this evening at 9 p.m. and number of 44. Here's that Timberline Lodge camera. The temperature at 28 degrees, the snow level has been as low as 3,000 feet. It's going up to about 4,500 feet this afternoon. And with that uh, snow level slightly rising, government camp is at 32 degrees. ODOT has that pretty much down to bare pavement with the snow in the middle. Clearly, there'll be some icy spots. But this location, government camp, might in fact stay above freezing all night tonight. So again, Good news for travel over in Central Oregon. They're being treated to a partly cloudy day. This was a complete snow cover at Eagle Crest in Redmond. Uh, but you can see the snow is about gone. They're currently setting at 36 degrees. The East Gorge, no problems here. Very low clouds, hazy, kind of foggy. But the temperature is warm at 39 degrees, meaning nothing but a chance of some rain. And then out in the blues, this is the best shape. Dead Men's Pass going into the Blue Mountains on I-84 has been all week. So icy spots, yes. But you can see a lot of bare pavement. And in fact, to our south, Willamette Pass over the Cascades, that's warmed up to 36. That's the first time I've seen bare pavement there, I want to say in weeks. It's been quite a while. And Brenda Siskiyou Summit, for folks going into California, that's pretty bare at this hour as well. Back to you. All right, good to know. Thank you, Rod. Well, it looks like the partial government shutdown will definitely last into the new year. Congress has closed out the week without a resolution in sight. Now the stalemate is putting some families in a tough position. They have bills to pay and no paycheck coming in. NBC's Hallie Jackson reports. The House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. on Monday, December 31st, After less than seven minutes in session, Congress is effectively done working for the year with no movement on a shutdown solution, no urgency and no optimism. I don't see a scenario where the government opens back up until a new Congress is sworn in. At this point, uh, it looks like we could be in for a, a very long term shutdown. That's a problem for people like Emily Garris, whose husband is in the Coast Guard and won't be getting paid on Monday like he expected. Well, if this stretches on, you know, into next month, it'll definitely be an issue for my family. My husband is the, you know, major provider for our family. Her family and thousands of others caught in the middle as the president digs in on that demand for money for a border barrier, blaming Democrats for obstruction, with the White House blasting them for not getting on board. We're stuck. It's a matter of principle for the president. Top Democrat Chuck Schumer firing back, his spokesperson saying for the White House to try and blame anyone but the president for this shutdown doesn't pass the laugh test. The one thing that we should all want to do, no matter what our political philosophy may be, is to keep the lights on. In this shutdown stalemate, a focus on the border. And that's where Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen will be today. She's traveling there after the death of Felipe Gomez Alonso, an eight-year-old boy from Guatemala. He died in New Mexico in the custody of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. His mother, devastated, explaining her son and his father were trying to escape poverty by making their way to America before both were apprehended. Gomez Alonso is the second child to die in U.S. custody in less than a month. CBP now says it's reviewing its policies related to children under 10 and adding secondary medical screenings for all kids in its care. That was Hallie Jackson reporting. This noon, New Yorkers are still talking about that eerie sight. The night sky glowed bright blue after an electrical fire at a power plant in Queens. A transformer exploded last night, but residents didn't know that right away. There was mass confusion and power outages. The FAA even temporarily grounded all flights at LaGuardia. This appears to be uh, just a equipment malfunction. Uh, it does not to be any terrorism or sus suspicious activity involved. 
Officials say no one was injured in the explosion and all major electrical lines have been restored. Well, lots of people are firming up their plans for New Year's Eve. It's coming up quick on Monday night. One thing's for sure, it is easier than ever to get safe transportation to and from those parties. KGW's Nina Melhoff has the lowdown on all the ways to get around and even some special deals. Nina, sounds good. Yeah, definitely. If you're headed out to one of the bashes here in downtown, you're going to your neighborhood bar, maybe a friend's house with TriMet and ride sharing. There is no excuse to not have a designated driver. So let's first start with TriMet this afternoon. Max and buses are going to be free starting at 8 p.m. Monday night to attract riders and they'll be running till 3 a.m. So you can hop on and get home safely. New Year's Eve is, of course, one of the busiest nights around the world for Uber and Lyft because of the sheer demand for cars you should expect surge pricing. That's when the fare is higher than it normally would be when demand is greater than supply. But more drivers will be out there looking to make money, so you should be able to get a car. And it's so much easier. Back in the day when we did not have Uber, it was impossible to get cabs in this town, even down here where we live. And it's just changed the way that people can get around. It makes it a lot safer for everyone. I usually don't go out. You know, I'm just a neighborhood mom. We usually just kind of hang low and make sure the kids get home safe. Ubers, yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, people waited like a minute and it's like right here. I've never, I just use the bus. So the city of Portland has teamed up with Lyft and local taxi cab companies to give you a discount. Cabs will discount rides up to 20 bucks and Lyft is $5 off citywide, but the catch is they're not giving out codes ahead of time. You have to pick up a paper coupon at one of the 70 plus participating bars and clubs. So we have put that extensive list of where you can get those coupons at KGW.com. Brenda, back to you.